Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Thursday afternoon in which looks like it's going to be very rainy weather if you are in the DC area. This is our third virtual event and the launch of our fall programming. So we're so excited to have Rex Delafkaran here with us today. Um, so just to give you a little sense of what's going on. Oh, I just heard thunder. What's going on with this program? So we are so excited to be converting this program to a virtual format because Rex and I began talking back in January about doing a conversation in our galleries in front of our wonderful Sam Gilliam and had all of these plans for some in-person gallery talk that of course is not able to happen. So I wish we were all together crowded in a space, but I'm so happy to have you all here in this virtual space together. And I'm delighted to be able to share Rex's work with you and talk more. Um, as you can probably see, I am back in the museum, which I'm thrilled to be back in the space. And we just opened our sculpture garden this week. We're making, we're preparing plans to reopen the gallery. So things are happening, but for now to be safe, we're, we'll be having all of our events online. So, hello Rex, welcome. Hi, Danielle, nice to see you. Did so you nice to see you. And I, I feel <laughs> like this is, you know, this is finally a culmination of all of these conversations we've had. And I'm so happy that we can finally do this. So when we last saw each other, I think this is right. We were in your studio at Stable. Mm -hmm. So this collaboration is part of an ongoing partnership that we have with Stable Artist Studios, where we have been working with artists based at Stable. And so I'm just, I'm thrilled that we're finding you at Stable right now so we can get a sense of perhaps some of the artwork we'll be talking about, um, but that we can, again, kind of share this virtual space together. So for this program, first, we'll be talking a bit about Rex's work. And, you know, one benefit to having this event virtually is that as much as I prefer being in front of artworks, of course, we all do, I'm able to share so much of Rex's work over the course of this event. And so we'll be talking about Rex's work and then getting into our Gilliam and she can talk a little bit about why it was a work that grabbed her and that she was interested in responding to. So um, at the end, we will leave the opportunity for a and a um, And so please, and I, I have control of the, uh, let's see, I'm the one controlling. Um, so you'll see here that there is the Q&A button. Please ask questions in that format. And then at the end, I'll be able to pull them up and help to respond to them um, with Rex. So we'll, we'd love to get your questions then. So before we get started with content, um, let's get to some artwork here. And just so you know that this program will be posted on our YouTube channel along with our previous virtual events. So if there's anything that you missed, you can find it there. Um, but we're delighted to have you here live. So a little bit about Rex. So um, Rex Delfkarn is originally from California, but has now found herself in Washington, which is thrilling for us, and currently has a studio at Stable. She's shown work at the Hirshhorn Museum, at Hillier Art Space, at Transformer Gallery, and the Textile Museum here in Washington, as well as Panoply Performance Lab in Brooklyn and Southern Exposure Gallery in San Francisco. She holds a degree in ceramics and performance art from the San Francisco Art Institute, which we'll be talking about ceramic and performance quite a bit together, and is currently also the exhibitions director at Hamiltonian Artists in Washington. So she's very busy, <laughs> to say the least. So. Um, so to get us talking about your work, um, let's start with these images. I know you work across so many different medium, performance, ceramic, installation, um, textiles, and but I know ceramics is a bit of your home in some sense. And so I'd love for you to tell us a bit about these works and, and what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier uh, before in preparation for the talk and this like ceramics being kind of a this, like you just refer to it as like a home, which I really enjoy. I think of it as kind of my staple and where I start with a lot of ideas. Um, my background prior to entering the fine art community and world and school, 
uh, is in Waldorf education and in dance education. And so for me, ceramics is the most immediate material uh, to work through ideas and to get a sense of uh, externalizing an internal thought, if that makes sense. Um, so with these vessel pieces, um, they have been kind of a long ongoing series that I've been working on since 2017, roughly. Um, and they all started, a lot of my work starts with writing and research and visual and written. And so it started with an investigation into Safavid era uh, Persian pottery and uh, functional ceramic ware. And I just started obsessing over these really ornate shapes that to me seemed non fun like their ornateness was prioritized over mm -hmm. function, but they were functional and they were uh, so considered every little, you know, shape and bend. So I thought that taking that as a foundational starting place and taking it into my like obscuring and like kind of awkward bodily uh, aesthetic would be really interesting to see how it would uh, pan out. And it turned into this series of vessels um, and they're all roughly two, I think minimum two feet in height and all uh, non-functional, all quite heavy, very much about the relationship between a vessel and a body, which I think is well-trodden -trod territory, um, and as well as um, the interaction between us and objects. So um, in Spout, you know, it's very, feels very directly related to parts of the body and like internal spaces and external spaces. And then there's these handles that are never quite uh, able to fit a hand, or there's so many handles you don't know where to put your hands, or there's only one and it's a two foot ceramic piece. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the work I make, I like to hope to project an interaction, even though they're not interactive technically. Um, and create kind of a, you know, we all interact with ceramics on a daily basis. Uh, through our coffee mugs, through our plates, through, uh, you know, a lot of like light fixtures, things like that. So I think uh, evening a playing field between the ornate and the functional in that material specifically is so charged. Um, it definitely is a home base and where I like to start from. Definitely. Yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned scale because I this is one problem, of course, with PowerPoint is that it totally ruins scale. And I do think the size, the the enormous size of some of these works is really important. And, and in connection to that, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about the pedestals, how they play into that relationship and, and kind of the, um, the politics of display for the works. Yeah, definitely. You know, the, the idea of the pedestal has been kind of creeping into the way I make sculpture over the past few years. Um, you know, we're kind of in a, it's kind of part and parcel to the white cube idea, right? Like the pedestal is both there and not there, you know, like the work is just substantial on its own. Um, but I find the pedestals can be really distracting. And also uh, it was, it started out as kind of a practical decision. I'm like, okay, I don't want to use pedestals anymore. Um, I want the pedestals to be part of the work. Um, but what ended up happening is that not only were the pedestals part of the physical physicality of the work, but they then took another step and are continuing, I hope, and want to continue taking this step of becoming kind of like a comment on themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that they're very self-aware. I intend them to be very self-aware. Uh, the piece on the left, this the ballet piece, uh, it's hard to tell in the image, but there's a beveled um, and routered fitting hole that the piece sits inside. So in person, it's actually quite funny. And there's, it's kind of like an overbuilt wooden pedestal that calls a lot of attention to itself. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of playing with the, uh, this like kind of institutionalized uh, lifting up and actually bringing it really down and really, um, bringing a little bit of humor into it and a little bit of tongue in cheek. Uh, this is just the thing this goes on top of mm -hmm. kind of idea. Uh, and similarly, but in a different vein with this, the cinder blocks, I've been working with a lot of cinder blocks lately, both in sculpture and in performance. And they're really charged and 
literally heavy material to me. And so using them as a pedestal, I think, is kind of pointing at um, the building up and, and disintegrating of architecture and structure. Um, and also has like a very, I always like getting them new, you know, like this like very clean, they the clean cinder block I find funny. Um, and again, kind of alludes to this, like it's sharp, right? It's a pedestal, it's sharp, it's clean, but there's something happening in addition. That's important. It seems, it seems like it relates to the kind of uselessness, right? That these vessels cannot be used and the cinder blocks will not be building or constructing anything, right? That there's kind of an absurdity there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love that. So, so when I saw you in your studio, you, you continue to work through ceramics, um, although you've branched out in all these other ways too. And, but I did see a little bit of, of something in progress. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what it looks like when you're making these. What, what's kind of the physical process of how you build them? Of the ceramics? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're coil built ceramic objects that I built from, build from the bottom up. Um, and then the handles for actually for the most part, except for the spout piece, are uh, traditionally pulled handles, which mm. is like a technique used in pottery um, that I learned just in order to use on a useless <laughs> object, uh, which is very fun to ask my pottery friends to teach me these things that will serve no purpose in the long run. Um, so there's a balance to me in the making of them that is very much like, I'm just gonna build this up, I'm gonna get some height, I'm gonna, you know, it's very labor intensive as far as like timing, ceramics is very demanding on the body and on time, um, especially when you're building big. And so it's usually nursing along the form for quite a while. Uh, especially for pieces like ballad, because that, again, hard to tell, but is engraved with Farsi as well, with the word ballad. So uh, to keep it the right surface texture um, was another learning curve for me in making these. Um, and then pulling the handles too, it's all, it's all a timing game, um, but so satisfying to build big. Hmm. So, and what does ballet mean? I realize I don't, I don't know. What is uh, that means that? yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to scooch because it's all related to what we're talking about to the next slide where I love this image of Blue Crush because I feel like it really, it gives a sense of, you know, this, that there is this also sensual, even erotic quality to some of these works and, um, and that there is a connection to your body, but to just bodies in general, mm -hmm. um, in terms of your work in ceramics. So can you tell us a bit about this series? Yeah, so I've also been working on these for the last couple of years. I mean, to be honest, I think it really started many years ago, but it kind of solidified form recently. Um, so it's a series of these kind of dildo adjacent ceramic objects um, that all have very different identities to them. They all kind of stand on their own as these kind of characters that are almost being personified to a point, but not quite. Mm -hmm. um, they're all usually glazed in a generally ornate way. Uh, most of them are glazed in a way that is technically functional, which is important to me. Um, and the series really evolved and got, became a series, like a, a full, fully realized series once I started making the, the connections between the, them individually as just fun objects to the larger scope of what I'm interested in in my work, um, being that this distilling of a form and of a gesture can really be so expansive. And so by making all of these phallic objects and giving them all this meaning and purpose and making these pedestal-like uh, sculpture stands for them, it really, for me is pointing at something a little bit uncomfortable at the same time as something really beautiful. So to me, in particular, Blue Crush, it's doing two things for me. You know, it's this, there's a humor to it, obviously. It's a little bit like, if you know, you know. Um, if you see it, you, you see it. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, and, and also it's really, pretty. Uh, it's really like a, a beautiful glazed thing um, that when shown in with within the series, 
you start seeing a bit of a pattern in the gesture. And for me, the gesture is very much reflected in Farsi mm -hmm. and the calligraphy style and starts kind of uh, drawing lines between all these points in my work uh, that are all, again, connected a bit to this understanding of language that I'm trying to build in the work. Um, how do you draw meaning between a literal language like Farsi and the language of my identity or the language of an identity outside myself um, and then put those languages into objects. Uh, so that's where the series came from. Um, yeah. It's, it's actually a nice segue to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so I, and I'd love to hear, I mean, how, you know, love to hear you just continue that thought into on four, four legs from the home country because of course the tapestry edition is very symbolic for you and and connects to all those ideas so if you can talk yeah about yeah the, the addition of the tapestry was a little bit um tender for me at the beginning you know I don't usually you know like ready-made objects present themselves in my work usually in the form of hardware cinder blocks uh, like a more like simple everyday objects. Mm -hmm. So when I decided to include a tapestry that was made by somebody else from Iran that was brought over by my dad um, as a gift, I was a little weary of it, but once it kind of came together, it really like did something new um, and bridged a gap actually for me. So the On Four Legs from the Home Country for me feels like uh, a direct exploration of the hybridity that I'm trying to figure out in my work, um, an exploration of like who I am in relationship to these objects. Um, and also a little bit of a, you know, I, I have a really good time with titling. I think that like that also, since writing is such a big part of the work in its building, um, I like when it comes back around. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, it's kind of like a little bit, it's building a bit of a myth. Uh, it's about a, li a little bit about my height, the full sculpture, and a little bit tenuous, and the detail of the, of the textile in combination with the dildo for me is really, um, it's both contentious and also super beautiful, again, just like, kind of like the rest of the dildo series. So, um, it felt like an edge that tipped into like a whole other understanding of this series and of this of my work, um, and it's super recent. As you can see, it's 2020, so I'm I'm looking forward to incorporating more of those elements that are traditional that do allude to my family and let kind of lets my identity in in a new way. That is, uh, it will be interesting to see how it continues to unfold. Are you frozen? Oh, oh, there she goes. I can keep talking. I never have a hard time talking about my work. Um, hmm. Ooh, well, I can talk more about, I can talk more about the humor in, in those forms. Um, so, the, so I'm referring to them as, dil, as the sculptures, the phallic sculptures as uh, dildo pieces, which for a long time I was avoidant of. But for me, the element of subtlety and humor in something that is so not subtle and so, I mean, really, really overt actually. Um, I love how it brings up this element of doubt for people when they look at the pieces. So, I mean, especially when they're just on their own, like the image that uh, Danielle was showing of Blue Crush. Um, when they stand on their own, there is a moment, there is a moment of, oh, let me see, I'm lost. Power. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, there's a moment of, of, you know, I might not know, maybe I should ask, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people do, and I like just calling it what it is, and adding that ele element of transparency and just getting that, this like upfrontness that they have about themselves. And that to me is part of how I mentioned they all have kind of an identity in and of themselves, like personified. Um, 
because they do say a lot, but saying very little. And in combination with the traditional tapestries, um, it starts getting into, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, I think, but um, there's a, a politic to a lot of the objects that I use and color and form and um, the aspect of my identity that I'm bringing in. Um, and it's also a relate, related to why I was so drawn to the Gilliam piece we're gonna talk about later. It's that how does that simplified visual language present itself, um, uh, simplified visual language presents itself politically um, in artworks. And like, at what point does it become a statement? And at what point is there like a little bit of room to feel uncomfortable and feel like you're doing a little bit of digging, like conceptual digging. Um, and I feel the same way about the, the vessels that you saw previously. There is, and you know, those were only two in this series of, I think, I have a handful hidden around my studio. There's even some one in the corner there with the six handles. Um, my studio is still a little bit of a mess. But uh, the vessels too, once you start seeing, seeing the form a handful of times, you really start to pick up on the references to the Safavid pottery and, and start realizing like, oh, it, you know, sometimes you don't know it's not functional and picking up on the fact, oh, like the bottom of it is empty. You're like, wow, that's really big. Could the handle support that? There is like kind of a, that conceptual digging, I think is connected to, to the humor in, in all of my work really. And le leads into the fact that I work in sculpture and in performance and like what happens when you introduce the body into the conversation and the inherent uh, politicalness of, of my body entering a space and how does seeing the body in the work then retroactively affect how you've read the sculptural pieces. I think that's, um, hi. Hi, so we have, we just briefly lost power at the museum because of the thunderstorm coming in. Oh my God. Everything is fine. But our computers are a little being a little pritzy, so I'm I'm calling it from my phone, and Sarah Hines oh. is going to bring PowerPoint back. So I have to give a little context for this because our last the last event I did, I was home and my internet completely went out inexplicably for five minutes, and so I think there's something in the Zoom gods that just <laughs> I you know what can I say it's. It, it keeps my blood pumping. So <laughs> thank you for, for keeping us going and sorry to everyone for that little hiccup, but um, it seems like we're able to, to keep it going. So what did I miss? Yeah, no, I was just talking, I talked a little bit more about these pieces and in relationship to the vessels and how those shapes and how the like kind of the political contextualizing starts to appear in smaller ways and the more you see them together the more they kind of start that train of thought going um and i oh, great yeah. so um if we can switch to the next slide sarah okay so i i don't know if this is a good transition but yeah. i know there's 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 relations here so i'd love to hear about the ben series yeah the Bend series I've been doing since this first image, uh, Bend White in 2017. And just to give a description of what they are is uh, one minute performances that I typically only show the image of, um, that I do all over the place wherever I can. And it starts from me kind of crouched down and then I slowly roll up and back into a bend and hold the bend until it is physically uncomfortable or unfeasible for me to stay there. And then I recover standing up straight. Um, the Ben series most simply came out of my desire to really like pare down and simplify movement in my practice. Um, I come from a dance background, like I mentioned earlier. So it was a challenge for me to find a place for movement in my work. Um, so once I discovered the relationship that this bend had for me 
to my sculptural pieces and to my practice of Farsi as I started to learn the language, which is going very slowly, by the way, um, I really got kind of obsessed with this, this repetition and uh, the, the repetition of the, of the character um, of the bend and the repetition of the bend in all my sculptural pieces as well. So doing them over and over again over time, I mean, it's been three years now and I've done them all over the world actually, uh, which has been really wild. The context dramatically changes the, the experience for me and for the image and for the people who see it. So they're generally in public spaces and um, that is important. I don't usually do them inside and I don't, or, or in like in gallery spaces, uh, being in the world is a big part uh, of the series. And I don't expect the series to end, maybe ever. Um, it's the first of its kind that I ever started and especially doing the very first one knowing that I want to continue it um, was a new way of, of thinking about performance for me, especially right. to, like just, it's, it's so easily distilled into an image as well. Um, and playing with, okay, if this is gonna be something that I'm gonna do for the long run, how am I gonna be able to kind of show that work and illustrate that work uh, in, my, in my overall practice and in the form of an exhibition? So, the bends are, are full, you know, they're full and continuing for me. Well, okay, so that's a nice way to switch to the next slide. Um, because there is a detail in this other work that actually shows one of the bends that we were just looking at. And, um, and kind of, you know, I think I love this as a, as a very physical link between your different practices, right? So can you tell us a bit about this piece? Yeah, so this piece is, this piece is super new um, and was a version of these textile collages that I've been making. Also, again, it's, it's a while to use language to talk about a practice that is using language conceptually, uh, but translating the live performance into sculpture through all, like these, all these different kind of roots has been really generative and really uh, enlightening. So for this piece, uh, the textile collage has a collage of all these, bend, a handful, not all of them, but just a selection of three of the bends I've done over the past three years. And then the piece itself is mimicking of the bend, not only in the performance, but in a flag series that I have kind of picked up and put down over the course of the past two years. Um, so this embodiment of the gesture being externalized into an object um, is a really important transition and translation for me in my work. And even in the background, you can see of the detail shot, you can see one of the vessels in the background as well. And so it really is, uh, another layer of the language that I'm trying to build in a very literal way. Um, translating, again, Farsi text into the body, the body into documentation, documentation into textiles. There's like this movement that happens with the chiffon in these pieces that's really um, important. And this kind of deconstructed flag form um, was a departure from a traditional flag series that I was working on. Um, That's but. so great. Well, and I, and I feel like the presence, I mean, especially because you can see, you're, sorry, you're getting like a little tour of the museum because my phone was about to die and so I've relocated, but your words were actually echoing through the galleries as I was switching locations, which felt like a very appropriate kind of connection to the museum. But I love that you can see the cinder blocks behind the piece too, that, you know, in terms of the, the connection of performance to physical object, that there is so much of this relation. Wow. There is, the gods of thunder are really, they're with us tonight. They're here. Um, and actually, if we can switch to the next slide about how these pieces, which I feel like could seem so different in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. actually do a 
major connection. Um, so yeah, you want to tell us about about how the flag series has kind of evolved in these different ways. Yeah. Yeah, so the flag series, um, actually from my a solo exhibition in 2018, and it came out of uh, a very particular moment when my work was making a very big pivot sculpturally, mm -hmm. and this introduction of working digitally and being a little mm -hmm. bit more direct in using politicized imagery uh, or form rather, less imagery, more form um, of the flag, um, I just leaned completely into and it kickstarted a larger series that actually I'm still working on. Um, so this original flag, the flag is for when you don't know where you are. Uh, again, referencing a little bit of a humor um, because it's a, pre, it's a flag that I designed digitally that has little to no meaning as far as flags are concerned and really just like distilling a flag to a simple and a personal form, which I find really complicated. And, um, you know, flags are really charged and in the histories that I was researching, especially at the time and now in Iran, um, I was particularly pre preoccupied by the switch of the flag um, and like the old flag to the new flag and how the new flag was so designed, is so designed. Um, and, you know, it has this like tulip shape and it's really like using Farsi as a, as a graphic design. And it felt very new versus the old flag was this, you know, this lion and the sword. And it had like kind of a, a royalness to it, like that was attached to the Shah and attached to a different time. Um, so I took that research and was like, you know, if I were to make kind of a funny flag that was still, you know, that was trying to do something vague, you know, flags aren't vague. Flags are very clear, they're political, they're concrete. So kind of the flag series came out of that exploration um, and, and, and the use of the digital. So fast forward two years later, I'm also still trying to find this place and this new way of working digitally um, and engaging, using the digital tools to, again, further like kind of unpack what the flag can mean um, and like repurposing a flag similar to the vessels. So I'm like repurposing, making it functionless, um, but still have like kind of a, a dialogue with its history. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's switch to the next, this is, you're giving me great transitions between slides <laughs> to the next one, because in terms of this pairing of digital and performance, right, a recent work, and it seems to be, you know, again, bridging on Ben's return and, and, um, and this has also been adapted to a, a virtual format, right? So it's a lot to unpack. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. And this piece is probably the freshest of all of them. Uh, I was commissioned for, to make this piece for a larger curatorial project by Natalie Von Bay. And, um, it is continuing to evolve as we speak. Um, but this documentation in particular and the performance itself was a live event that was streamed on Zoom, Twitch, and Instagram. Um, and the imagery, imaging that I'll, sh well, I'll talk about, I'll talk about the digital image first. Um, so that image with the Benz, the Farsi, and the English text, um, I used as a stand-in and a kind of a culmination of the archive that the work was based around and as a score. The score became so much more than this image, but it does distill kind of the general idea that I was working around and kind of stands in as a reference point between this and the documentation of it happening live. Um, the, the Farsi text is pulled directly from the Iranian Oral History Archive hosted by the Harvard Library. Uh, it's an oral history project that was initiated in 2012 that is now over, but it lives online as an archive that I've been working with for the past year and a half, two years. 
And so the text is pulled directly from one of the interviews, uh, oral uh, interviews, recorded interviews, uh, transcripts that I that was playing in the background, among other things, during the live performance. So that is more of a physical, literal score. The text were pieces of writing that I used to mark changes in the physical performance and the movements. Um, very specific pointing to what's happening next, very practical language. And then the bends were used to kind of illustrate and kind of pull, pull the gap a little bit closer when looking at a score when the active performance was not, is not always available to see at the same time. That was kind of a very COVID uh, online decision that I made. Um, oh no, she lost connection again. Sad. Why don't you talk briefly about the Gillian? Yeah, of course. Um, but I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> like, you know, this is a Zoom artist talk, like gorilla style. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm back. I'm here. I'm, not, I'm listening. I heard it. <laughs> yeah. Just moving, look, looking, for, looking for power. But we're, <laughs> all, the, all the power we need is working. It's just a matter of where it is for death space. So, um, yeah, anyway. But you get your words echo as I move locations. <laughs> Um, well, I, I want to, I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about Gillian before we take questions. So um, why don't we, I don't want to cut you off there. So I think we're, we will talk about your work still to Gillian, just there if you can. Great. Um, so when we were first talking, um, whenever you came to the museum, which now feels like another, another life ago, but it was earlier this year, um, we were walking around the galleries and, and trying to find the right place for the, the talk and what find the work that would really speak to you. Mm -hmm. And I think by so we walked through most of the museum and I think you were you were waiting for a matchmaking moment and maybe getting a bit nervous that <laughs> wouldn't work, right? And then we turned the corner and got to the Gilliam and I think love struck it. So um, of course this is a really hard work to not be in front of because it is just so enormous. It's nine by nine, it's you know, um, nine by nine feet, it's it's immersive, it has incredible color. So I think if we can put on our imaginary caps and pretend like we're in front of it, um, do you want to tell us a little bit why you chose to talk about this piece? Yeah, of course. Yeah, gosh, you know, um, I mean, the transition between the last slide and this one for me feels, you know, in revisiting and preparing for this talk, feels really, uh, I always use the word, ten overuse the word tender, but it is, it was, because work like this, as someone whose first art language was dance, you know, I danced my whole life and I can do, it's like work like this, especially in the form of painting, makes me want to dance, you know, it makes me want to, uh, it's there's something about the expansiveness and the materiality and the um the tactility that it conjures for me that on a surface level just at like first glance not even really doing the deep dive was just like yes like i just want to be surrounded by works like this um and then knowing knowing the little bit that i do about sam gilliam and his practice over the, over the years and his influence um, and, you know, really remembering the first time that I saw his drape pieces and the amount of space and movement that those paintings can, or, you know, paintings can take up. Um, there's just an incredible image of his work installed at Dia Beacon. It's just unbelievable. It's so expansive. And for me, my, who does, for someone who doesn't work in painting and who, uh, has a different relationship to it, I think, as a medium than a painter would. That conjuring of movement and uh, and intimacy that he can do at the same time, I find really striking and strike always strikes me immediately when I see his pieces. Um, and then, in addition to then know more about when these works were made, know more about uh, about his work as a as a practice is really as a whole other layer of depth 
um, to me. And, you know, there's a, I feel like he's quoted regularly. Um, I wrote it down just to make sure. Yeah, the, that art has like a potential to call attention to politics. Um, and when I think about my anxieties around, or like my decisions around choosing what to acknowledge as political and what to not in my work, and a lot of the language that people bring around identity politics and art and are you a political artist or not? You know, I think that you and I talked about that a little bit. Um, I find his attitude towards it and his use of abstraction around his experience and not about his experience is really, so uh, he distills it really incredibly. Um, and I'm really inspired by that way of working. Well, it, I mean, it, you know, just for context in terms of this work, you know, thinking about the way that they're made. So, um, so this piece is part of his slice painting series from the late sixties. And, and there is, um, there's a very particular and very kind of experimental method of making going on where the paint were stained with pigments and kind of layered with all of these um, splashes and pores and then left to dry and unfurled and after they were unfurled we would sometimes add additional pieces so we discovered recently that there is this metallic powder that he had kind of thrown into one part of the surface and there's this big giant splotch of yellow paint in, the, in one corner and so he kind of continues to manipulate the surface but it's of course very much anticipating the draped paintings which you mentioned that come that are, he's making at the same time he made this piece so they they're very much in relation and just the physical movement of having a canvas that big and having to fold it and unfurl it and it, there is so much of that movement that's important to the actual making of these pieces that it really yeah it makes sense to me it, i mean it's really so where it'd be so wonderful to be in front of the work but um, they were mounted on beveled stretchers and so the work actually comes away from the wall as if it's a slab and, you know, of course, that to me, even just calling it a slab references that kind of ceramic physicality, but also that there is a more physical presence to the painting, that it has a kind of um, a, an interesting relationship between painting and sculpture. Um, and so there's so much more to unpack than the color, than the composition, that there's all of these methods of making that I think are so complex. Yeah, and I mean, the images from his studio at this time, where you get to see these mm -hmm. pieces all stacked on top of each other, and then, I mean, absolutely, but the, I mean, the beveled edge, I mean, yeah, the whole thing feels very sculptural and very, I mean, I have a bias, and I, you know, everyone around me can tell you that I consider everything a performance at a certain point, and so there is something kind of performative to me in my interpretation of the works, about the process of folding being so evident in the final piece and about the drape pieces and, and knowing that they were happening at the same time and everything else that was happening in the world at the same time I find really um you really see it all I don't know like the lay it all really just uh impressive how it can all kind of be held in that yeah. way well Sarah can you go to the next slide um and so of course it's it's wonderful to think about. I mean, and I think a, a drape painting might be a more direct comparison, but, but to think about how you're thinking about layering surfaces, how you're thinking about uh, a printed surface and an object together. I mean, I think that there's some nice parallels that we can draw here, you know, and, and also just um, how you are disrupting our assumptions about textiles in this work. I think just having the performance layered into it, you know, it's, it's similar to the Gilliam where there's a moment where you, you're not sure what you're looking at and then you look closer and you see all of these different aspects. Like something that's really wonderful about the Gilliam is that the fact that he's staining the canvas in the, with these thin washes means that you have all these kind of halos of pigment that, that kind of appear the longer you look. And you can kind of tell from the image, but the, there are these pillars that also appear and that's from just the literal folding that happens where, you know, it's, you're seeing the impression of the folded canvas. So, um, so I don't know if you, there's more you want to say in terms of seeing these works together. Yeah, I mean, I, there is, but I want, but I, the most uh, direct 
relationship. You know, it's so funny to think of our, think of my work in anywhere near the same space or realm because it, I'm just like, no way. But, but there is like a handling. I think when I, when I really respond this way to certain types of work, it's when it's not just the hand, you know, we talk about the hand and the work, but it's really like the handling of the work that I see in m most of his, of his work that I really relate to and I find to be like integral to everything I make, like everything really needs to be handled. And like, even though this is a digital tapestry, there's like a lot of handling happening with it. And it's a lot, a lot very, um, and like the gesture of the handling and ceramics too, everything has to be like, there's just like a, a very uh, intimate and physical relationship that happens that I think I respond really well to um, in other people's work as well. Well, and, and, the, and the propping too, I mean, all these, like the support system, I mean, I think about him using beveled stretchers, you know, there's this, it, it, again, it kind of disrupts our idea of, of what support should, a support for work should be. And, you know, the fact that you have it kind of hidden, it's kind of peeking out at the end, I feel like is, is really a wonderful detail. And, and Sarah, do you want to just go to the last slide? And of course, you know, there's something about the color of this, of this photograph and and the, the sheer movement in it. I mean, it, you know, again, I think, I mean, what I love about, about your choice of this piece is that it, it changes the way we think about this painting. You know, it, it, it gives us a chance to think about movement as an aspect of this painting or a performance or, or just the motions of making, you know, that there's, there's something behind the painted surface that, that we're reminded of, you know, and so, seeing an image of your of one of the bends of this the, the sheer physicality and then the color of the setting and your your you know your clothing as well i mean there's something about it that i feel like in seeing these two together really activates thinking mm -hmm. about the flame is made yeah I, I mean i love seeing it through your eyes and i love being able to see them next to each other in this way um and yeah i mean i think this piece in particular, like the use of color was more intent, like was like kind of a, a, a different kind of decision that I've made in the past with the bend pieces and to see the relationship between that choice and like the dripping, not drips, but like the, the marks on the, on the painting, I think is a really, it's kind of like you could put a little me into the, like yeah. there's like, kind of like a bend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. Um, so I want to give a chance for questions because we're down to the last 10 minutes, yeah. but, and I don't know because now I'm, you know, on my phone in this strange way, I'm not seeing any questions. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in a and a and we have a chance now to answer them. But while we're waiting, is there anything that we missed talking about? Is there anything that you want to tell us about since you're in your studio? I don't know if this is a chance to tell us something about your workspace, you know? Well, let me turn the light on. I'll do that first, because I, I turned it off to get some natural light because my light is on a timer. So if I sit okay. still for too long, it just shuts yeah. off. Well, mm -hmm. that's better than power. <laughs> oh, I do see a question. So while you're doing that, okay, from Leslie Holt, I've always loved your use of humor. Can you talk a bit more about it? Yeah. Hi, Leslie. Um, yeah, humor. Humor has been something that I've been, it's been there the whole time, but it's really made more of a, an appearance and a show of itself in the past few years. Um, yeah, I guess particularly with the bends, the bends don't have that going on as much, but the performance from this year, the everything I hold is wet performance and the the objects, absolutely. Um, the, in the performance, you know, the live recording is obviously like ideal to describe this, but even in that mo in that gesture still that that I shared with you, you know, dance is such a rich history that is very fun for me as a trained dancer to pull into performance work and signal that form of humor. Um, you know, I have a, a phrase that I use sometimes. It's like, it's what dancers do. Uh, like, that's one of those things that dancers do. 
Um, and so distilling yet another type of physical language to use as a humor tool in a piece that is for all other intensive purposes, very intense. A lot of my pieces are very physical and very um, uh, taxing in a lot of ways. So to include like a bit of ballet just for a second to kind of break uh, a mood or break a, a train of thought that I'm exploring physically in front of an audience um is one of the ways I like to use humor and then the vessels and the dildos both I think the, like removing function and bringing a new function to them uh I think is inherently funny to me and I like that there's a room for it to be both I think that's maybe my brand humor is that I I want there I want it to be a little bit sinister or like a little bit uncomfortable and funny um to make space for both because I feel like I'm of two minds about most things, of those two minds about most things anyway. Um, sure. So the, the choice to not make a fully thrown vase is very intentional. You know, it's, it's intentionally sure. lumpy, intentionally heavy. Um, I would throw it if it needed to be anything other than that. Um, but hand building it and the, the chunk to them, I think is, uh, again, another, like aesthetic of humor that I like to employ. Hmm. That's great. I love that. Um, okay, so we're we're seeing your studio now. Is there anything since we we can take advantage of you being in that space? <clears throat> anything specifically you want to share with us, or or just kind of nod to? Um. Yeah. I guess I can show. I mean, you were talking about pedestals earlier. How am I going to do this? Um. I guess I can give you like a really is raining you like a fun oh, we, wait we have another question i i, I don't want to lose time for this um yeah. so one of our wonderful docents at the krieger is asking um she says i'm interested in, to understand your comment about sam gilliam's work it makes me want to dance can you explain oh boy that's great thank you for that that's great <laughs> um yes i can explain i think so the thing for like the, the way in which I understand and experience dance based on where I came from and where I've arrived and not even just dance, but like the body and movement in general um, is that it's a, for me, a very direct way of bringing an inside thing outside. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I've experienced this with some, I mean, like, a, like a seeing a huge Louise Bourgeois, like, these like huge stone slabs that are just big and like soft and they're like, they're hard and soft. They're, you know, work that is in the Sam Gilliam piece, like these like edges and the folds and like just immediately imagining what a fold is. Not the cork of mine, but also just like a, the way I visual, like bringing, internalizing his, this painting in person it being bigger than bigger than my wingspan and taller than me, mm. make, and it being so three dimensional um, in so many ways makes me then want to become that big and that expansive. Mm. Um, and especially, I mean, the Krieger Museum is so beautiful. And while it was in, it wasn't in like the main hall, but having come through the main hall and the staircase and the like the, the feeling of the museum condition, you know, it's just like, it's a big space. I mean, all museums generally make me want to move around, um, but this piece in particular uh, and, have, and being able to call all of his work, I mean, I feel like it's a good representation of like a lot of his work at once in a way. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like an embodiment process that occurs when I see this painting. <laughs> I love you talking about wingspan because I think it's, you know, these things are a reminder that there is a, a body um, necessity for artists working in certain ways that they, they, they need to be able to actually, you know, their bodies need to handle the, the optics the same way you're talking about your ceramics, this, the sense of kind of like your body is, is manifesting these, the shapes and the size and the scale and that all these things are so related. Um, there's another question. From another from one of our wonderful docents again. Um, 
were you influenced by the works of Shirin Nishat by incorporating Farsi text in your works? I mean, not directly, but of course, I mean, she's kind of like a staple to using Farsi calligraphy in yeah. her um, very influential to see as a young artist for the first time, especially in person. I mean, honestly, I think the works have to be seen in person. Like those are just in a lot of ways lost sometimes when you see a flat image of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's a long history, both in the, both like, in like ancient history of Farsi being incorporated into like illuminated texts and miniatures and, uh, yeah. There's like a long history that I feel more drawn to uh, as far as um, direct inspiration for incorporating the text into the work. But as far as contemporary references, absolutely. I mean, I think she's, she is one of many and um, someone that, yeah, someone who I love to think about in relationship to my work, though maybe not a direct uh, reference or inspiration, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I think it, so it, it reminded me, so I had put this into one of our promotional posts about this talk, but mentioning your Farsi English dictionary in your studio, since, especially since we're in your studio, I actually remember you talking to me, looking at that about the shape of Farsi, that there, you know, that there is this lyricism to just the language, um, that of course in, in Shirin, Shirin Nishat's work, you have this connection to the language in the body that's imprinted, right? That's very much direct, but but that there's something about Farsi that has a, you know, that is is has an elegance that in a way relates to the body, relates can relate to performance in ways that other languages might not be able to. So I don't know if you want to, you can show us the dictionary, but if you want to talk a bit about Farsi as a language and kind of, you know, how what that signifies for you. Yeah, I mean, my relationship to it is that, you know, I've never been able to speak it. You know, it's been around me my whole life and upbringing, but I, I never learned. So my relationship to it now, as I am like very gradually bringing it into my life and trying to learn it and um, through learning it, producing work around that learning um, and becoming more intimate with trying to write it and trying to say a few words to my dad and saying a few words to the of my life. Like it's very, um, my relationship to it is very much uh, of an in process, if that makes sense, or like a trying. So it's not very resolved. So maybe that is why I feel quite separate from Shireen Nishat's and her relationship to the language and being Iranian is very different because I am half Iranian, very American, uh, new to the language, uh, really unpacking what both of those sides mean. Um, so for me, yeah, the lyricism of Farsi is so, it's like uh, maybe more groundbreaking to me because I don't speak the language and then I am learning it. Um, and yeah, the gesture I mean, specifically, I've been using as a, as a score for a lot of my sculpture and performance work. So mimicking uh, mimicking those gestures and trying to like dance them in some ways. Mm -hmm. Very much of the work. Okay. Um, okay. I think there's just one more comment, and then I think we should wrap up here before. I lose power again. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's just interesting. So it's not a question, but a comment. Um, the the person speaking says we own a lithograph by Gilliam from 1972 entitled Dance. This must have been a theme he cared about, and that's an, that's an interesting subject to pursue. I'm very curious about that. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I mean, it definitely you know, and I think I think in in you know, in a certain ways, our Gillian is it's definitely at this precipice because he starts working in the the drapes at the same time and then continues to work in the drapes. And so that physic is really as if, as if that physicality bursts from the wall and has to manifest in all these other ways. And I, and I feel like that's also true about your work, right? That there is this kind of bursting of physical presence that's been continuing to evolve, really starting since the ceramics, right? Yeah, absolutely. Physical presence 
bursting. Those are all words I would use. Um, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, looking, being able to, like, in this context, take another look at Gilliam's practice over the years was really uh, wonderful because it's, like, how I describe my work lately has been, like, building this language and building a type of continuity that is continuing to evolve and bring meaning in new ways and take aesthetic changes and turns. So to see uh, a work that I've responded to so much more than I ever have before or ever re realized um, and see that span and see that language he's built and the, how, I mean, just how massive that practice is now uh, was very, feels really uh, aspirational and uh, striking to me. Yeah. Well, that's a nice way to close. So. Thank you so much for being here and thanks to everyone for your patience through some of the technical difficulties, but I'm so glad we could do this and, and I look forward to when we can do it in person again. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for having me, Danielle, and for all of our visits. It was a total pleasure. For me as well. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Thanks for coming.